effects of those two wave trains crossing one another. So we see places where the waves annihilate one another and where they reinforce one another. So the interference is so from a, a from a pair of <coughs> correlated wave sources. Yeah, this is a kind of a ripple tank uh, film or animation of a ripple tank. Thing. And again, with the n lambda over d, the sign of uh, the arc sign of n, n lambda over d gives the angle of these bright beams. This is supposed to be uh, yeah. All right. Okay, so we see the transverse waves, which are the ones we're most often interested on the left, or longitudinal waves. These would be like compression rarefaction uh, waves in, uh, say, air. So, uh, in effect, we can be thinking about uh, sound waves from a violin or sound waves from a flute or organ horn. And here are, uh, is an illustration of water waves, where it's not just a matter of up and down motion or to and fro motion of the elementary particles of the, of the medium, in this case water. These guys near the surface are actually undergoing a circular motion. But the motion gets less and less as the depth in the water and it gets greater. And so we see the wave action on the surface, but lower down. Yeah, maybe you remember listening to the news stories about the uh, tsunami, that in deep water, uh, it's, it's not sensed, but it's at the surface where all the action is. So, but in every case, these little uh, balls connected by springs, um, they're transferring, we can see that energy is being transferred uh, in the, in the, with the motion of these waves, but that the particles of the medium, water or air or whatever it might be, maintain their mean positions. So they're moving about their mean positions, either up and down, back and forth, or in circular, but the, main, the particles maintain their mean positions. So the medium does not move. Uh, but the disturbance moves, uh, as illustrated. There's another nice nature example of like waterways passing through uh, these break wall slits. And but the, we, we get, in effect, the circular wavelength. Huygens' prim principle illustrated. You have these a combination of wavelets giving these spherical wave fronts. Only when, if these were further out, would we see the plane wavelets. On an even larger scale. I think I got this photograph from Eddie Snell. I know I got it from Eddie Snell, and I think he got it from that. So, but you see, through the Straits of Gibraltar, the, the, this wave pattern occurring. It's not only just the matter of the of Spain and Morocco acting as the borders of a slit, but there's also a dramatic change in the depth of the water here. That's generating these waves that we see here, but um, we can also see crossing patterns of waves and giving us those familiar inter interference effects, constructive and destructive interference. So near the source of a wave, so-called near field uh, circumstance, we, have, we consider spherical waves. So the, um, the wave fronts are uh, spherical surfaces. But when you get far enough away, the curvature uh, from the source of the disturbance, the curvature of these wave fronts is negligible, and then we're talking about plane waves. And for most of what we're going to talk about, uh, probably for the rest of uh, the week, we're we'll be concerned with plane waves. So 
considering the wavelengths that we're talking about, these 10 to the minus 8 centimeter wavelengths, um, we're very far from the source. We're many wavelengths away from the source that we're considering. We're in the far field. Uh, this is another one of these illustrations of plane wave. Okay. Why would be a way for me to... Uh, I guess I just have to learn how to use it. Oh. Okay, so we're on to the plane wave. And this is the situation that we want to uh, think about or come to understand is when we have a what's pictured here as a two-dimensional array of scattering centers, obstacles uh, in the path of the plane wave, uh, or in our case, uh, this might represent a, a layer of the sodium chloride lattice with sodium and chloride ions at the corners of these squares. So the incident plane wave sets, gets each of these centers uh, as becoming a source of a spherical wave. These spherical wave fronts, as they advance, combine until finally we get uh, an envelope surface tangent to the uh, uh, intersecting spherical wave front and a plane wave scatter. So incident and scattered waves of interest are, uh, in our applications, Plane waves. That is just so. Just a little bit of uh, algebra, a tiny bit of calculus. So, in those notes that I handed out, um, basically uh, these couple slides are talking about what is in those notes. So we want to get from a description of uh, the wave. So here's a generic, say, water surface wave. And we see that the, that the wave displacement in the y direction is a function of distance along the, so here's wave displacement here, here's a negative wave displacement, and so on. So the, the y coordinate is, um, follows the x-axis as um, the velocity of propagation or speed of propagation follows time. So we just say that this is, this is some function that's going to describe this wave as it varies in time and space. Well, if we have composite functions like this where u uh, is uh, some function of an independent variable, which then in turn acts as a variable, uh, independent variable for the function f. If we want to differentiate such a function, then we first differentiate y with respect to x. Uh, to get the derivative of y with respect to x, we first differentiate with respect to u, okay? derivative of this function f with respect to, and then multiply by the derivative of u um, with respect to x. So we get this is the result for differentiation of a composite function. Well, in the case of these wave functions, uh, then we, the derivative with respect to x would give us whatever that uh, df uh, du might be, we just call it f prime, first derivative of f with respect to this composite variable x minus ct. Okay. Similarly, with respect to uh, the time variable, derivative uh, of uh, f with respect to u, so that's the same function, f prime, of x minus ct. But now we have to differentiate this quantity x minus ct. That's the second uh, partner in this composite derivative. In this case, differentiating with respect to x um, just gives us unity. Right? There's no uh, derivative with respect to time because time is just uh, first order. So we would get then, uh, with respect to time, the negative of this speed of propagation, c uh, times the same quantity as here, f prime 
x minus c. And then to do the second derivatives, uh, we go through the same process again. We get the second derivative of this function f. Whatever it is, we don't know the nature of the function f yet. Uh, we get, but it, uh, we, we assume that it's differentiable. So we get a second derivative, again, of x minus ct. And that, will, that tells us about the curvature of the wave as we go from point to point along the x-axis, whereas uh, the first derivative uh, as we go along the x-axis is telling us about the slope. Okay, so here's zero slope, increasing slope, zero slope again, decreasing slope, and so on. And here, clearly, the curvature is uh, sharper than uh, here in these minimum features. Well, what do we then see? When we form the second derivative with respect to distance and the second derivative with respect to time, this quantity f double prime appears in both. Right? And that's the same quantity. So we, if we equate these, uh, if we say f prime to f, f double prime to f double prime, then what we end up with is that the second derivative with respect to distance here is equal to 1 over c square, because here's where c square comes in, uh, differentiating x minus ct a second time, 1 over c square times the derivative with respect to time. Right? This is the wave equation. An equation of this form generalized into, say, three dimensions, three space dimensions, as well as time, uh, governs all kinds of wave behavior, water waves, sound waves, and as we are concerned here, electromagnetic waves. So this is the, the wave equation. These, uh, this, this, for example, represents a wave function. And that's the distinction in terminology that's made. So here's a classical wave function. Uh, we still haven't specified what is the nature of this function f. We have just said it has to be a function which can be differentiated twice. Uh, and this just reviews what I've been blah, blah, blah about all along. Okay? So we get the we get the wave equation from a wave function, an unspecified for the moment wave function. As long as it can be differentiated twice, we can then derive the wave equation. So then the, the, the wave that was pictured earlier, or any wave, is uh, characterized by these wave properties that defend, depend on the periodicity of the wave. The periodic, periodicity in uh, distance, in x coordinates, say, is lambda. Okay, so we have a period lambda corresponding to the x coordinate. And the period with respect to time, denoted tau, right, is the period uh, for one wave cycle. And then using those two fundamental characteristics of a wave, its wavelength and its period, uh, we write down these expressions for the angular frequency okay, uh, and the wave number or wave vector magnitude and the speed of propagation. So these are the, uh, the little list of relationships among the basic characteristics of a wave that constitute um, the dispersion relation. The other thing that's emphasized here is that when we're writing down wave functions, uh, functions of distance and time uh, of the form distance minus uh, propagation speed times time, usually we uh, rewrite the function in terms of dimensionless variables, kx, and omega t. Okay, so k now is equal to 2 pi divided by the wavelength. <coughs> omega is equal to 2 pi divided by the period. So when we write kx, well, we have 1 over distance times distance. So kx is a dimensionless variable. Similarly, uh, omega t, uh, omega has the dimension of uh, inverse time. So omega t is a dimensionless variable. And these 
it, it's uh, convenient to uh, describe the wave in terms of those dimensionless variables, kx and omega. And one of the reasons, or the reason, I suppose we could say, that we want to do that is express the wave in terms of uh, omega t and kx is that uh, if we're going to if we're going to let that unspecified function be a sinusoidal function of time and distance, well then the arguments of the sinusoidal function here, the arguments of the cosine function, the arguments of any cosine function must be dimensionless. So when we evaluate the cosine of 90 degrees, we're actually evaluating the cosine of pi over 2, a dimensionless quantity. So any argument of the trigonometric functions or of the exponential function uh, must be dimensionless, and hence we use the omega t and uh, kx or kr uh, dimensionless variables. So a little table that just summarizes all those wave properties and, and gives their name. Here's just two ways of expressing the wave. Here we have it as a cosine wave, all right, but it has to be, here we start out zero at zero with respect to uh, distance and with respect to time. A, a cosine wave then would start at unity right, on either axis. So there has to be a phase shift applied here of pi over two. For this, this particular wave function as illustrated here, to describe it as a cosine wave, we have to sh have phase shift of pi over 2. And the cosine, as we shall see and utilize over and over and over again, the cosine function is the real part of an imaginary exponential function, which <laughs> the imaginary unit got lost. So it should be e to the i times this. Uh, function argument, omega t minus k r. I'll correct the slide. Right? <clears throat> so this relationship between the, the cosine and sine functions and the imaginary exponential function, the so-called Euler relationship, is key to practically uh, everything we do in the theory about x-ray scattering and diffraction. So what, we're con what we've been concerned with here, looking at those wave pictures and diagrams and so on, is the notion of superposition of waves. If we're concerned with two waves of the same frequency, that is the same wavelength and the same period, right? if, so that's the, the blue and the gray wave here. If they're in phase, if, or nearly in phase, they reinforce one another, okay? So here we're getting constructive interference. And if they're exactly in phase, of course, uh, we get uh, yet, a yet higher uh, peak and yet deeper trough. But if they're nearly out of phase, right, almost 90 degrees out of phase here, the uh, gray wave with respect to the blue wave, then we get a weakening of the resultant wave. The red resultant is uh, weaker than either of its components, less intense than either of its components. The wave displacements are smaller than either of the component waves. And if the, the uh, phase difference is exactly 180 degrees, then annihilation, as we saw illustrated earlier. So this is a key phenomenon uh, for interference and diffraction um, here illustrated. Again, we have equal, uh, equal frequency waves, the red and the blue, but um, unequal amplitudes of these waves, but still constructive interference builds up to uh, amplitudes, which is the sum of the two amplitudes, if they're perfectly in phase. And here, destructive interference, which is not annihilation because of the uh, basic amplitude, of the reference amplitude of the red wave and the blue wave. Even if they're perfectly out of phase, uh, exactly 180 degrees out of phase or pi out of phase, uh, we don't get entirely, 
we don't get annihilation. We get still destructive interference, but not annihilation of the one wave by the other. Uh, another illustration of the same thing. The picture is worth a thousand words, and I guess I won't use a thousand words to describe all of the pictures which are saying the same. But we can have a, a, and we see a situation here where we're combining waves of a given frequency, equal wavelength waves, with various phase shifts. And so there can be a net uh, enhancement, a net superposition sum that's greater than any of the components, uh, even though there are some components which are exact, which seem exactly out of phase. If the phase differences are small, then the, uh, the wave sum is going to be similar to uh, its components with here a phase of zero, here a phase of pi over 10, that's this dashed line, and here a phase of nine pi over 10. And notice that these two guys uh, essentially uh, cancel the nine-tenths phase essentially cancels the one-tenth pi phase, right? and so the sum is quite close to the original phase zero. So all of these different ways of superimposing or superposing waves and considering constructive and destructive uh, interference effects are, are what gives rise to a, a diffraction pattern. And notice that these diffraction patterns will get yet more complicated if the um, the waves if there are waves of more than one wavelength. Right? So these are again equal frequency waves to make a simple diagram. But if we try to superimpose waves of different frequencies, we'll get a more complicated diagram, of course. And that's what goes on in an X-ray in Lowy's X-ray diffraction experiment. He had polychromatic radiation, in which there were some parts of the beam had a strong uh, peak intensities, but there were uh, many different wavelengths. So a great simplification uh, in the Bragg understanding of things was to employ uh, monochromatic radiation, or nearly monochromatic radiation. Uh, okay. A little bit about electromagnetic waves now. So you've no doubt seen this picture before where we describe electromagnetic waves as oscillations of uh, electric field, here depicted in red, and uh, complementary uh, oscillations of magnetic field uh, depicted in blue. These are going to be waves of equal frequencies okay, and they will be in phase but they have orthonormal amplitudes of vibration. Again, our little picture of the spectrum. So what, where do these electric and magnetic effects come from? Essentially, all the light in the universe, whether we're talking about gamma rays or X-rays or radio waves that have wavelengths of kilometers, the origin of any of this electromagnetic radiation, any and all electromagnetic radiation, is uh, acceleration of charge. Starlight, though, all those uh, electrons and protons and neutrons that constitute this, well, not the neutrons, the electrons and protons that constitute the matter of the star um, are in, of course, vigorous, vigorous motion uh, in many directions. And that's the origin of the light from the star, the accelerated charge. So what we see here is if we consider a point charge here, Q, and accelerated in what we describe here as the z direction. And we go out some distance from q in, in an arbitrary direction, here denoted by this uh, radius vector v. Then at the end of that vector r, 
the electric field component uh, of the electromagnetic radiation is perpendicular to R. Okay. That is, it's parallel to this projected uh, acceleration vector, the perpendicular acceleration vector, the component of the acceleration that is perpendicular to the radius vector R to the direction uh, in the direction of the observer. And the relationship between the, the strength of that uh, uh, electric field vector and the charge and the acceleration is this kind of straightforward one. Well, let's look at the simplest one first. The, uh, the electric field vector is equal to the negative of the ratio of the charge to the velocity of light times the radius at the acceleration magnitude and the sine of the angle between the acceleration vector and the uh, radius of observation vector. And to get this uh, transformed into uh, vector notation, so the vector, electric vector E, same coefficient, Q over C square R, and with the negative sign. Why negative? Because E and the perpendicular component of A are anti-parallel. So to get uh, the sine theta part of it, we cross uh, a unit vector parallel to R into the acceleration vector, and, and then take the product that results in a vector, which we then cross into the unit uh, radius vector to get sine alpha. So the, the cross product of vector one and vector two is equal to the, uh, the magnitude of uh, the cross product is equal to uh, the product of the two magnitudes times the sine of the angle between them. Just reviewing some high school or maybe college introductory physics. And this, again, illustrates the perpendicular character that the electric vector is anti-parallel to the component of acceleration that is perpendicular to the uh, radius vector to the point of observation. So if we consider just, uh, for the moment, a, a pulse of acceleration. So we're considering we have a, a, a point charge with this electric field surrounding it, right? a stationary charge, and then we uh, give a, a pulse of acceleration and move the charge from A to B. As a result of that accelerated motion, so, so from A to B, and then now that it's had an acceleration, it will have a velocity. So we assume acceleration from A to point A to point B, here, and then uniform uh, motion, constant velocity motion from B to C. So considering now from the point of view of this later point, C. So from C, we have these electric field lines of force uh, going out radially, but the electric changes in the electric field or the magnetic field can only propagate at a certain rate. In vacuo, that's the, the speed of light. So after the, after the uniform motion from B to C, uh, we have this arc QQ prime, which is as far as the result of that acceleration could be noticed or experienced. But beyond, uh, but beyond there, from this arc r, r prime, this is what the situation of the electric surrounding electric field was back here. All right? So this part of the field is just like that part of the field here when the charge was at rest. And so and this part is now the field at this instantaneous field at this point C after the acceleration and uniform motion. And we've got now this kink in the electric field. This is just due to one impulse uh, accelerating 
uh, momentarily accelerating the charge from A to B. So if we consider what does the electric field look like going over this kink, so like so. Right? So at some point on the kink, we'll have two components, right? uh, a horizontal and a vertical component. And this vertical component is the electric field uh, corresponding to the vertical component is indicated by this little Gaussian curve. That is, along each of these little kink lines, the field varies from uh, no difference, say just here, to no difference out here, and gets goes through these values of the electric field in the time in between. So all that is summarized uh, up here in these equations. At a distance that is greater than or equal to RR prime, that is the outer uh, radius of the kink, then the uh, we have the field corresponding to uh, the the speed of propagation times this time difference to AB plus the time difference to BC. That's the outer uh, outer ring. And the inner one, just uh, the speed of propagation times the length, the time length between B and C. Now, if we go on further and consider not just a pulse of acceleration, but an oscillation, which always involves acceleration. Remember, acceleration is a change in the speed and or direction of motion. So in an oscillatory motion, we have to go to uh, speed zero at one end, and then increase the speed uh, and get to zero at the other end, then decrease. So, so it's a constant. Uh, alteration of the acceleration of the charge. So an oscillating charge gives not just a pulse of radiation, but a, uh, a wave of radiation. Again, due to acceleration of charge. And that's just telling us the same two slides on, uh, on one. Picturing the same thing again, if we, if we were considering a particular acceleration that was vertical in the earlier slides, if we consider one that's horizontal, we get the same kind of phenomena, an inner and an outer ring for the governed by the finite, low large, finite speed of propagation. So here's the field that was due to this circumstance, this being the origin. Here is the field that is due to um, the charge after the uh, moment, the acceleration. Right? We're just looking here at one kink in the field as we did earlier. Not the we're not considering oscillatory motion of the charge in this uh, little illustration. So one thing to notice is that in the direction of the acceleration, right, the field doesn't change. Right? So along the axis of um, of the accelerated motion, no change in the field. But as we get away from uh, that direction, going out to a maximum uh, in, in the normal direction, the field differences between the inner and outer radii are increasing. That was also uh, clear here. If we're talking about uh, vertical acceleration, then you can see that these kinks are getting smaller and smaller. If we continue the diagram down to this vertical axis, there'd be no change there. So the maximum radiation, the maximum change in the field is in the directions normal to the uh, direction of acceleration. It's another illustration of the same thing, for a hard, again, for a horizontal acceleration. 
smaller and smaller kinks nearer the acceleration direction, maximum field difference in the normal direction. So now just some little electromagnetic wave uh, movies. How do we describe these waves? Well, sinusoidal waves we can describe as a, as a cosine function of omega t and k, in this case z. In, in this diagram, blue representing the electric vector and uh, red representing the magnetic vector. Just fun to get hypnotized by these guys. <laughs> right here, too. So if we're just considering one point along the path of the wave, we see the decrease in electric vector up, up, down, up, similarly back, forth, back, forth with the blue one, the magnetic vector. Not all of these people who make these movies follow the same convention, but generally, more often than not, the electric field is represented by a red vector and the magnetic field by a blue one. And here that variation uh, in the field is described by, uh, we hear a, co a cosine function. It can be described by a, as well by a sine function. It just needs that pi over 2 uh, phase shift to account for the difference between cosine and sine. That's one of the trigonometric identities that uh, you learn very early on. So if we think about what's going on here in terms of Faraday's law. So we depict um, an electric vector in, in the x direction, okay, and magnetic vector B in the uh, y direction. So if we're, if we're considering, say, a microcurrent along this uh, electric vector direction, then we know from Faraday's law there would be this uh, wraparound of magnetic uh, flux uh, circulating about the current direction. So here we're looking at this mini um, microcurrent diagram perpendicular to the uh, current direction. But if we're looking now down or looking along the current direction, we can say, okay, around here we've got uh, this electric, we have these circular electric vectors circulating. But notice what happens as we're going along uh, from instant to instant. So here we get these vectors canceling here, 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 along this um, direction, this direction perpendicular to the electric vector direction. So what's left then is that these guys are uh, adding in a parallel manner here, 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 here. We've broken this up into finite components. So we get uh, net uh, electric, uh, I'm sorry, net magnetic vector, net magnetic vector. And again, the governing motion by a sinusoidal function. Uh, try to depict this same thing in, in three-dimensional space, and again, reversing the color coding, blue for electric and red for. So we've got these, we're, we're considering an oscillating charge, a point charge oscillating along this direction. So that generates a, 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 bo a, a bolus, say, of uh, electric field variation. Okay coming from, say, motion up. From motion down, there's an adjacent bolus of electric field direction, but notice these guys are alternating uh, in direction of their uh, electric vectors. Similarly for the, the magnetic fields. So here in the inner ring, we've got 
uh, this motion, and in the next ring, we've got motion in the opposite direction. So they're alternating two. Hence the oscillatory uh, sinusoidal nature of the wave propagation. So what we can think of plane waves as altering the condition of space. So it, in the vacuum, um, there, there's no empty space. There are things there, these waves. Right? So the, the, even the vacuum is not empty space. Physical space, uh, is, we talk of it as free space if we're far removed from any material objects or from charges or uh, currents. You know? But there, if there's a plane wave propagating through free space, we can think of it as this three-dimensional, uh, well, actually four-dimensional alteration of the condition of space, changing with respect to uh, X, Y, Z, and with respect to time. Time is moving only in one direction, right? but X and um, X, Y, Z are uh, oscillating. Another depiction of the same thing, just the electric field component. So that a, a plane wave can be thought of as just as a bundle of these rays, these electromagnetic rays. But it's again, it's filling three-dimensional space and propagating in time. This is an illustration of how we might imagine the oscillating, accelerating uh, source source for electromagnetic radiation. We can have we can consider a fixed uh, point charge that can oscillate in any of what uh, can have components of oscillation in three mutually perpendicular directions. If, if the spring strength, so to speak, in each of the three directions, the force constant of each of the three direction springs is the same, okay, we get an isotropic disturbance, oscillation in space of this uh, point charge. Or it could be anisotropic. There could be reasons why, uh, say, a bound charge might be freer to oscillate in the vertical direction uh, than in either of the two horizontal directions. We could have uh, anisotropic elasticity of the medium. These are movies to, excuse me, to pick these things. Can I make them work? So there's uh, one of what we imagine as the three-dimensional possibilities with the, uh, the springs connecting the point charge oscillate. But if we're concerned with uh, just having the charge oscillate in one direction, only one pair of springs, then we get the same kind of thing, but in the direction of the oscillation, no radiation of these uh, field effects. Again. So the oscillation of the charge causes these wiggles or breaks in the lines of force in the electric field. Um, So you can meditate on these uh, electric uh, dipole oscillator movies and diagrams. We're going to move on 
just to begin uh, talking about the scattering and interference and diffraction effects of X-rays, uh, in particular uh, with crystals. So if we're considering scattering of electromagnetic radiation, there can be coherent elastic scattering. That is, no change in energy of the radiation uh, before and after scattering. There can be incoherent inelastic scattering, which means that there is some exchange of energy between the incoming radiation and whatever is doing the scattering, say uh, an atom, or an electron, whatever. Uh, when we're talking about these coherent elastic and inelastic effects with respect to visible wavelengths, we talk about Rayleigh scattering and Raman scattering. Well, the blue is really difficult to see. Possible. Ah, okay. I know what's there. If we're concerned with X-ray scattering as opposed to uh, visible or ultraviolet or infrared, the the coherent elastic scattering is is Thomson scattering, named after Thomson, who was the uh, first to figure out uh, the. Uh, generation of X-rays by scatter, uh, consider scattering of X-rays by an electron. And if we're concerned with the inelastic part, so-called Compton scattering. Here we, we will, as we will see, we're talking about uh, a wave interaction, and here we're talking about particle-particle interaction. So here's a, a diagram for Thomson scattering. And we're just considering now the scattering by a single electron. Okay, if the electron is sitting there initially at rest, we have this incoming um, beam of uh, radiation, this incoming radiation wave, denoted here as um, e to the i omega t. Then uh, that electron acts as a new source for radiation of the same frequency as the incoming radiation, same frequency and energy as the incoming radiation. We use a script E as opposed to Roman E to distinguish between the incident and the scattered wave. So it, the electron acts as a spherical source sending out uh, in all directions. Uh, radiation of the same wavelength and period uh, as the incident radiation. So here we're selecting two possibilities. We see, uh, so, well, three really. So there's some of the radiation is not scattered. Most of the radiation is not scattered. It just passes straight through. We're considering here a case where it's scattered at right angle. And here a case where it's scattered at 45 degrees. So each of these uh, sinusoidal oscillations is uh, representing one of these rings. So the oscillations are taking place all around. We're talking about three-dimensional scattering from this uh, agitated electron, accelerated electron. So that would be the case for Thomson scattering, no change of energy between, or wavelength, between the scattered radiation, these rings, and the incident radiation, this plane wave. So, uh, spherical wave of scattered radiation, plane wave of incident radiation. Compton scattering, on the other hand, the picture that explains the experimentally observable effects due to Compton scattering uh, we, we consider the incident photon, a particle of X-rays that collides with this uh, initially uh, at-rest electron. And then there is an exchange of momentum between these uh, incident and scattered beams. So some energy from the incident photon is uh, given to the electron so that the scattered beam now is a somewhat 
a longer wavelength, smaller energy, and the energy that's given to the electron sets it in motion. It's a, a recoil event. And the angles involved in the scattering and the recoil electron direction have, uh, are measurable. This so-called Compton effect is a, a billiard ball collision between a photon and uh, an electron, in which there is a momentum transfer, an energy transfer, hence an inelastic collision. If we consider now, what about these things going on, uh, x-rays impinging on a crystal? So this calculation has been done by uh, Elspeth Garman, who, by the way, is being featured by Bruker Instruments in one of these uh, web uh, lecture things. I'll, I'll try to remember to send around the, the how you can tune into this. You don't have to be watching it at the time live. You can they'll they'll leave it posted and you can watch it later. So Elspeth, uh, who is a friend of the institute and in particular good friend of Eddie Snell's. Uh, she and her students, there were several co-authors here, did calculations of what can we expect if we have one angstrom wavelength x-rays, or thereabouts, uh, interacting with a typical protein crystal of size, say, uh, 100 microns, so a, 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 a beam big enough to bathe the whole crystal. What happens? Well. For 98% of the radiation, nothing, just straight through, uh, and as we know, x-rays are penetrating. If we had, instead of a protein crystal, we had uh, lead sulfide or something, then the transmission would be lower. About 1.5%, and in this case 1.7%, is so-called photoelectric absorption. That is the the, the material takes some energy out of the incident x-rays, which finally is degraded to heat, right? but um, would not be present in either the scattering or the transmitted uh, wave. About 0.15% uh, uh, it gives rise to Compton scattering. There's this in, small amount of inelastic scattering, and then ab about the same amount of elastic scattering, Lowy Bragg scattering. So this piece, this 0.15% that's scattered elastically, is what we see in those spots on the film, those beams of radiation that we measure, the in, uh, of which we measure the positions and intensity. Where is this radiation? This radiation is in the background, is the, constitutes the background, or the fogging of the film, or the background counts uh, in the electronic detector. So notice that the, the two kinds of scattering are in roughly equal amount. So there's about as much X-ray energy in the background of the film, the general fogging of the film, the background uh, of the detector uh, image, as there is uh, in the discrete scattered beams, the Lowry Bragg scattered beams. So what Elspeth is going to be talking about is uh, essentially what happens as a result of this photoelectric absorption, how is the, how are the, how is the protein crystal damaged by virtue of absorption of this radiation? The absorption, of course, will be larger if the wavelength is longer. So with softer x-rays, there's more absorption. With harder x-rays, there, there's less absorption, but then with the short wavelengths, the the diffraction pattern is concentrated uh, more closely to the incident and therefore harder to measure the positions and intensities of spots that may be overlapping. 
But okay, so this is a good place to to stop. I think we'll get on now. Next, we'll continue on Friday, considering um, basically the algebra. We today we try to talk a little bit in pictorial form about the physics behind the diffraction process and. Next time we'll talk about the algebra of the diffraction patterns, the geometry of the diffraction pattern. So I'll stop there and thank you for your attention. So, so these slides, I, I think I sent you an email. So these slides are now on the uh, FTP site. You can delight yourself by looking at all those pictures of uh, wave motions and the animations of uh, electromagnetic radiation effects. Okay, so it'll be good till Friday. Yep.